All right, looks like we are live. Welcome to Standing for Truth, everybody. I am your host, SFT, and today we have the privilege of having Dr. Ken Colson here with us. Ken, thanks so much for being here and giving us your time. You're on mute, Ken. Oh, nope. No worries. I, I, You're I, right I, now. And we're good now. You got me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, it's great to be here, guys. I'm I'm excited to to talk about uh, this subject today. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ken. I know you're incredibly busy. So again, I, I thank you for giving us your your time for this important show. Now, to the audience, uh, if you are not yet subscribed, then please make sure to hit that subscribe button, especially if you love uh, debates, lectures, presentations, discussions and more. So that being said, uh, I'm going to hand it to George. Actually, you might have a few words of introduction, and then we're going to hand it to uh, Dr. Colson. Um, George, go ahead. Oh, th th thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming to our show, uh, Ken. Uh, we we've been in, in sort of touch with Ken over the last month or so. Uh, after having watched, uh, I actually have seen all of your videos, Ken. They're very good. I'll I'll provide a link to your channel in the in the uh, comments section uh, a little bit later, but since the um, topic of discussion is uh, is creation science an oxymoron, can we say in the same breath, um, or can we call uh, directed evolution an an oxymoron? Because how how can evolution direct anything? Right, that's what you love about the word oxymoron, right? Because yeah. it's uh, <laughs> it's one of those fun terms. Yes, yeah, like is. like uh, army intelligence. Uh -huh. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if I could, George, I'm just going to yep. give uh, Ken a brief audience. This is uh, Dr. Colson's first time with us. So for anybody not familiar with, with Ken, um, firstly, you can check the description box where I've linked uh, the appropriate websites and articles and uh, his papers where you can find more about him. But that being said, Ken Colson earned his BA degree in Christian ministries from the Masters University in, in Santa Clarita, California, his BS degree in geology from Cedarville University in Cedarville, Ohio, and his PhD in earth science from Loma Linda University in Loma Linda, California. Now his dissertation is on Cambrian stromatolites and micro Biolites. I, I just butchered that, but <laughs> microbial lights. There we go. There you go. <laughs> Their formation and environmental significance. Ken fostered a mindset of critical thinking. He was the assistant professor of science at San Diego Christian College. So uh, once again, to the audience, please check the, the description box for more on Ken. And Ken, I'm going to hand it to you if you wanted to add anything in terms of introduction before we get into your uh, PowerPoint presentation. No, nope, all sounds good. We can just get started. We ready? Awesome. Yes, we're good to go. Okay. I'm going to put it up on screen. Okay, good. So um, I guess, uh, you know, kind of a strange title, right? Creation Science is an Oxymoron, but I didn't come up with that by myself. It was actually, uh, it was actually John MacArthur who used those words, and, and this is a quote from him from a GTY uh, Grace to You website. Um, he says, in a sense, when you use the phrase creation science, that's an oxymoron. And uh, I remember when I first read that, and uh, actually, I, I'd actually heard something like that from him before at a creation conference at the Masters University. And it kind of struck me as I could see how creationists might at first kind of recoil uh, from that phrase. But uh, I want to go on to uh, discuss what he's trying to say. So this is also on that same page, and I've got the, I've got the uh, link there for it. Uh, he, he says, science is a study of natural law. Creation is supernatural. You can't explain creation by any natural scientific method. It was the most massive supernatural miracle that ever took place. So uh, what uh, John MacArthur is trying to say, what he's not trying to say, is that we as creationists can't use science. That's not what he's trying to say. Uh, what he's trying to say is that the physical universe is moving. The physical universe uh, has a ton, billions of parts that are moving, that are interacting with each other according to natural laws. And because of that, we can apply science to the physical universe as we see it today. And that's fine. We all agree with that. But what he's getting at is that uh, during creation week, 
uh, Creation Week was a very special event. And because it was a very special event, we can't apply science to Creation Week for the purpose of understanding its origin, or at least perfectly. And so that's what he means when he talks about creation science as an oxymoron. He's talking about um, he's talking about the concept uh, of creation during Creation Week. Uh, so again, we as creationists are doing research in lots of different areas. So for example, uh, we talk about the overflow, uh, lake overflow hypothesis by Dr. Steve Austin for Grand Canyon. There are other Christians who believe or other creationists talk about Grand Canyon is from a uh, flood runoff. I personally uh, adopt Dr. Austin's view that this is from an overflow hypothesis from, from lake overflows. Um, so that's creation research. There's my own research on uh, Pre-Cambrian uh, uh, on uh, uh, pre-flood flood boundaries uh, and uh, looking at stromatolites or microbialites uh, to understand some of that. So that's creation research. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, you know, I'm not a biologist, but uh, we all love the motor proteins, right, that are working inside our cells right now to carry uh, a, a basically biological information across our cells, physically and literally. Uh, these motor proteins are walking. And so uh, this, of course, is uh, important areas of uh, intelligent design. And so uh, there is lots of areas that uh, we can look at as creationists to do creation science. And in fact, these scriptures are clear about that. It says in Romans 1, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. And then David says in the Psalms, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. In other words, look, you can see God in creation. There's no doubt about that. And so that brings us to this conflict again. Um, so when, when John MacArthur is talking about, you know, uh, is the phrase creation science an oxymoron? because we're getting back again to what happened during creation week so we can apply science to all these areas uh, like like uh, uh, the the uh, lake overflow hypothesis grand canyon uh, pre uh, pre cambrian uh, flood boundaries uh, 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 areas of intelligent design and so on and so forth but we can't apply scientific methodology to creation week for the purpose of finding out for example how old the universe is. Um, and I know that a lot of creationists will disagree with that concept when we're talking about creation week. But this is what John MacArthur is saying. And that kind of brings us to the crux of the issue here. And this is actually a quote from a couple of well-known creationists. And I don't have their names up here, but I mean, I appreciate these guys. I, I, I'm thankful for the work that all creationists are doing uh, for the glory of Christ. But I really disagree with this particular quote. So it says, if a person were given science tools but had no preconceived notions about the universe, would purely objective observations lead that person to believe in a billions of years old earth and universe? And notice the categorical statement, by no means, since so many features look so young. And, and when creationists use the word young, um, we've got to remember this is not a relative term. We're using the word young in the context of a scriptural perspective. So uh, it, it doesn't matter whether the universe uh, is a million years old or even 500,000 years old. If even it was shown that it was 500,000 years old, that still does not accord with scripture. Uh, scripture clearly teaches that the universe is six to 8,000 years old. So when we use the word young, in young earth creationist lingo, what we're saying is that um, it accords with scripture. In other words, that when we look at the universe, it's going to show evidence of being six to 8,000 years old. So I disagree with this statement and I wanna show you why. Uh, I'm gonna use the earth as an example. Now, uh, I know that in uh, Christian circles, there are several ways of approaching Genesis. As far as the as the there's the ex nihilo kind of traditional perspective where uh, God just sort of clicked his fingers, boom, and there is the earth, and then he created the uh, the sun, and then uh, the uh, the rest of the planets and the universe, etc. On day four, and that's a perfectly valid and perfectly 
excellent explanation for the text. Um, there are other uh, perspectives uh, going around. M mine is one of them, uh, where God used processes during creation week. And Danny Faulkner from Answers in Genesis is another one who takes that perspective. And I know others don't, they don't like that. And that's fine. It's it's okay. Um, it's, it's not going to uh, be a heretical view one way or the other, whether God used accelerated process during creation week or whether he just sort of uh, created things um, out of nothing. Um, so they're the two views going around in uh, creationism uh, in reference to Genesis 1. But at the end of the day, uh, it doesn't really matter which view someone takes because uh, I'm going to show that either way, um, we can see that vast amounts of processes are stamped onto the creation, and that's really important. Uh, so I want to uh, take a look at uh, this slide shouldn't be there. So anyway, uh, here's this slide. I want us to have a look at this slide. So uh, we from high school, we're familiar with the, the basic structure of uh, the planet. There's a core, uh, there's a mantle, and there's a crust. In this picture, actually, there's a liquid and there's a, a solid core. So we're, fam we're familiar with that from, from high school. But I want to take us to the real structure of the Earth because this was what God made during creation week. If we go and look at mountains and streams and uh, sedimentary rocks, we don't know if that was sort of something that was formed during creation week or whether it was something formed after creation week. But we can be absolutely sure that this was formed during creation week, which is really interesting because it means there's a huge amount of, of, of geological material that was supernaturally created that we can look at and that we can study. Um, so when you look at the uh, the core, the mantle, and the crust, we know that they are differentiated into that core, mantle, and crust. And uh, a lot of, uh, well, the secular perspective on that is that essentially, you know, in the beginning, billions of years ago, which of course I don't believe in, uh, there was a sort of an undifferentiated mantle, kind of one, uh, a substance uh, that, that was sort of uniform. And then uh, because of gravity, and because of heat and uh, other uh, mechanisms such as partial melting and fractionation and other things, uh, the heavier elements uh, made it down to the, to the core. Uh, so you've got nickel and iron down there. And then the lighter elements made it up into uh, the crust. So, And they've done experiments on this. They've taken mantle-like material, they've heated it up, and the, the lighter or the less dense minerals like quartz and plagioclase will tend to, or well, they're not tend to, they will, they will melt first. And if they melt into a liquid state, uh, then uh, given gravity, they're going to make their way upwards uh, towards the surface of the earth. And it makes sense then that that's sort of how, very, very simplified view, because you've got a whole, a whole bunch of other stuff going on, like plate tectonics, and uh, you've got uh, partial melt and fractionation going on with sinking plates and recirculation of, uh, of lighter uh, uh, felsic material to make crust. I, I realize all of that for those who are technically into that. But generally speaking, it's a pretty good view for how the Earth was differentiated. And as far as I know, all creationists that I know accept that view, uh, whether God kind of stamped that onto creation uh, ex nihilo or whether uh, sort of he... Uh, caused the earth to differentiate during creation week. So that's a reality that we have to deal with. That's a bunch of processes. So now let's take a scientist and let's uh, say the scientist is going to study the earth. He's going to study the earth's crust. Um, so uh, let's put him then on the uh, Canadian shield. The Canadian shield, as far as I know, all creationists believe that the Canadian shield is creation week rocks. So let's put our scientists on the Canadian Shield, and he has all of the scientific techno technological tools that he needs. Um, let's call him an unbeliever, uh, and and so this is this is when he's going to be obviously a biased. Everyone's biased, right? Whether they're a believer or an unbeliever. But you put our creationist on those rocks, uh, and let's say that he was let's say he was biased towards even a creationist perspective. He picks up those rocks and he studies. Uh, these rocks using science. What kind of conclusions is he going to come to about the age of those rocks? Is he going to think that these rocks were created in six literal days? Now, think about all the geochemistry that's in these rocks, all of the processes 
that are in these rocks. And, and really, it's not even six literal days because uh, according to scripture, uh, the earth came out uh, from the oceans on day three. So it's actually 72 hours. So would he um, conclude on the basis of science alone? OK, and this is important on the basis of science alone. Would he conclude that these rocks were made in 72 hours? And of course, the answer is no. OK, that is a, he absolutely would not come to that conclusion uh, because of all of the processes that are involved in the geochemistry. Uh, he would conclude that the that those processes should be interpreted in terms of time. And that's what humans do. Humans interpret process in terms of time. And so more than likely, he is going to conclude at the very least that uh, these rocks formed over millions of years, if not billions of years. That is the conclusion that he's going to come to. And so this is why MacArthur says you can't explain creation by any natural scientific method. It was the most massive supernatural miracle that ever took place. And then he goes on to say this. Uh, someone says, rhetorically, don't we have to apply science to the Genesis account? And John MacArthur says, I say it again, you can't apply science to a miracle. It's impossible. And I absolutely agree with him. And this is really, really important, I think, for creationists to get their head around. And this is also biblical. You can use lots of biblical examples to support this. Think of Jesus's wine. He made wine uh, in just a few seconds. Now, if we took a winemaker and we studied that wine, what kinds of conclusions would we come up with? Well, more than likely, we would uh, suggest that the wine uh, came from uh, vines that grew, which had grapes that were crushed and then fermented maybe for several years. That would be what we would conclude. Would we go looking for the in the wine for a miracle that showed us how it was made in two seconds? Of course not. That would be ridiculous. Um, there is Jesus's fish and the bread uh, as another example and lots of other miracles that Jesus did like this. Um, these uh, objects are completely natural objects. Uh, if you study them, uh, you would uh, come to conclusions that they were completely natural and developed naturally. Uh, take Jesus's fish, for example. If you could get hold of one of those fish, you would see that it had bones. You would see that it had organs. You would see that it had chromosomes and the chromosomes themselves would be indicative that it had a mummy and it had a daddy. That is what we would conclude if we were to open up those fish. Now, in other words, there'd be a very natural history that sort of uh, compacted in this supernaturally created fish. So that's something to keep in mind. Would we go to Jesus's fish if we had it looking for signs that it was made in a few minutes. No, we wouldn't do that. So why do we do that when we uh, look at, for example, the Earth's core mantle and crust? So that brings us back to this statement again, um, when it says that if we look at everything in the universe, um, does it look old? And they say by no means. And I really think this is wrong way of looking at things. We shouldn't be ashamed of the miracle of creation, just like we shouldn't be ashamed of the fish, the wine, uh, the bread, and anything else that Jesus made. Um, Jesus wasn't deceiving the people at the feast when he took the wine and gave it to them. They enjoyed the wine. They thought the wine was grown from vines. In fact, they thought the wine was fermented for a very long time because the master at the feast said, hey, this is really good stuff. This is good plonk, this is. So uh, he wasn't deceiving them. Uh, those people, if they wanted to know where it really came from, uh, they couldn't ap apply science to the wine. They had to have faith and believe in the miracle. And that's what we need to do, I think, with Creation Week. Now, I do want to clarify something. Uh, when I say things look old, and this is really important because people have misquoted me here, I am not saying that God made the universe to look old. Uh, as though he was sort of into the distressed look. Okay, that is not what God did. What I'm saying is God used abundant processes or abundant processes were stamped into creation from the beginning. Either way is fine with me. Um, he used abundant processes or abundant processes were there. And humans, we interpret processes in, ter in terms of time. That's our problem. So when it looks old, 
What I'm saying is humans look at processes, they interpret processes in terms of time, and so something looks old. Okay, so uh, this all, of course, accords with scripture uh, from Hebrews 11.3. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. This is the writer of Hebrews. What's he referring to? Well, he's referring to the book of Genesis. Uh, this, is, this statement is not just said in a vacuum. He's not asking his readers to go outside and look at the rocks. He's asking them to go to scripture and understand that by faith, we understand that the universe was created. I mean, even in his day, the idea of, a cre of an entire planet created in six days, well, that was absurd. Even in his day, that was absurd. So that's why he's telling his readers, we understand this by faith. And you could actually take this word universe and you could replace it with the word bread, fish, wine. And we see that in each of these cases, it is only by faith that we understand that these things were made because they were miracles. We don't apply science to them. Okay, leaves us with three questions. Does this mean that young earth creationism is a useless discipline? Is God lying? And does that mean that if I'm a Christian, I can't be a geophysicist or an astronomer? Well, uh, the first one is a categorical no, because as we've already seen, there are areas of creation research that we can be involved in. Uh, you can go to uh, my uh, YouTube channel, uh, Creation Unfolding, uh, on YouTube, and I've got a whole a couple of uh, videos there on soft tissues in dinosaurs. Uh, another area, a fruitful area of creation research, and there's lots and lots of others. So no, it's not a useless discipline. Is God lying? This is clearly no. And it, it kind of often befuddles me when old earth creationists think God is lying when the scriptures clearly just tell you, right? It says, for in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. And elsewhere in scripture, many times it clearly states this. And I think God has clearly said this because the creation week is an extraordinary event. He wants to make sure we understand how to interpret the processes. He's basically saying, look, there's a lot of process here in a very short period of time. So I'm going to tell you up front how much time it actually took. OK, the last one. Does that mean then that if I'm not a Christian, I can't be a geophysicist or an astronomer? And the answer, of course, again, is no. Why? Well, because the universe is a natural object. It is a natural object, just like Jesus's fish is a natural object. And if a biologist had one of Jesus's supernaturally created fish, uh, he would uh, he would be able to study that fish. He would be able to study how it works, how it ticks, how it all comes together. And uh, a Christian can do the exact same thing with the universe. Now, things get a little more complicated when we're talking about the origin of the universe. And it would be like talking about the origin of that fish. So let's use that fish again as an example. Um, what would we find? If we were a biologist and we had one of those fish and we wanted to find out something about the developmental history of this fish. Well, um, and this is really important for kind of uh, my view on these things. And of course, um, this is a, really a kind of a philosophical perspective attached to theology here. Um, this is not scientific. This is my perspective. And I understand that people disagree. Um, but Jesus's fish, the supernaturally created ones, were patterned on the original fish that were brought to him. Uh, just like the bread was patterned on the bread that was brought to him. So I believe that a biologist could look at this fish and he could find out something about the developmental history of the two fish, the original fish that were brought to Jesus, without even looking at them. Why? Because that historical development is tied up in this supernaturally created fish. And he wouldn't be wrong in the assumptions and conclusions that he came to about the development of the fish. But he would need to understand by faith exactly what the origin of the fish was. So I want to use another example now, and that would be Adam. Adam is kind of very similar to the fish. He was created fully mature. Now, we don't exactly know how old Adam was. Uh, was he sort of 30, 25? Uh, was he 16? Uh, I don't know. I don't know how old Adam was, but I think we can, we can be safe and assume that he was a sexually mature adult. 
So Adam's created as a sexually mature adult. But could God have created Adam as a teenager or a 12-year-old? Could he have created him as a boy? Could he have created him as a baby? And the answer, of course, to all of these is yes. And I think everyone would agree. Well, yes, of course he could have done that. But why do we believe that? Well, we believe that because we know that uh, the development of humans uh, it was not an afterthought. We understand that God had intricately worked out the development of humans from a sperm and an egg uh, to a zygote, to a fetus, to a developing baby, uh, to a toddler. All of these different stages of development, which is really an infinite series, okay? There's no actual stages, right? It's an infinite series of iterations of development. All of it was worked out right down to the smallest molecule and cell and even the behavior uh, that the, the goes into that development. All of that was perfectly worked out. And so, of course, God could have created Adam in any of these stages that he wanted to. So what we then accept is there was some kind of abstract or conceptual developmental series for Adam that existed in the mind of God. Um, and I want to suggest that there is a similar kind of developmental series uh, for the universe. So the universe uh, was created fully mature, uh, just like um, Adam and just like the fish. Well, if... Uh, fish have a developmental series and Adam has a developmental series, is it possible that the universe also has a developmental series? And uh, this, again, as I know where, where, where people d disagree with this, and that's perfectly fine, and it's only an idea, okay? And this is not uh, clearly written in Scripture. But what I'm suggesting is that the universe has a developmental se uh, series, Um and so the question would be then, well, what does a baby universe look like? And the answer is, I've got absolutely no idea. And I personally believe no one will ever know for certain what a baby universe looks like because, well, we don't have experience with it. Uh, not only that, uh, but scientists only are able to detect about 4% of the known universe. It's 96% that we cannot detect. Imagine having 4% of some animal and trying to figure out what it was. Uh, that's basically the task that modern astronomers uh, and astrophysicists, etc., cosmologists have trying to picture and, and work out how the universe developed. So I don't believe anyone will ever have a, a perfect picture of that. But I don't think that should stop a Christian astrophysicist from trying to figure that out. And this is important. As he's trying to figure it out, as with the developmental series of the uh, of a human being or a fish, that developmental series is going to be completely natural. It's not going to have any supernatural elements in it. So what God did, he has this developmental sequence in his mind, and uh, he decides at a certain point in uh, of, of maturity of that universe, he decides to bring that universe into existence in six days. So the first thing he brings into our historical context is the earth, then he brings in the sun, and then he brings in the stars. So that's my own personal view. I understand uh, that people may not appreciate that or are kind of thinking a bit, a bit, uh, think that's a little bit difficult, but um, that's, that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, so uh, as there is a mature uh, universe and a mature uh, atom and a mature fish and a mature uh, uh, bread, uh, these things have some kind of natural developmental sequence that the scientist can study. Now, this is really important. The scientist, however, if he's a Christian, he's constrained by scripture. In other words, he appreciates the fact that Adam was created supernaturally um, uh, from the dust of the earth. However, that shouldn't stop him thinking about a, a developmental sequence for Adam that fits with uh, scientific methodology. And the same with the universe. That shouldn't stop him from looking at the possible uh, development of the universe. But he's constrained by the origin of the universe from Scripture, which clearly tells him that the earth was created first and that the earth and the universe were created in six literal days around six to eight thousand years ago. But 
and this is important, those concepts can only be believed. And that's what the writer of the Hebrews is getting at. He's not getting at the development of the, the universe and the science behind all that. He's getting at its origin. We need to have faith. We need to believe what God has said in Scripture because God clearly says that in Exodus 20.11. Okay, so that is the presentation. Um, let me hide that and hopefully I'll – oh, no. Can you guys bring me back? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've removed the uh, the PowerPoint, uh, Ken. And then uh, what I'd recommend for you is you might want to uh, find the, the studio okay. again. Got okay. you. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I want to point out that was a, uh, a fantastic presentation, of Dr. Colson. Uh, it flew by and uh, the audience uh, really enjoyed it as well. And what comes to mind, a few comments um, that kind of come to mind, Ken, before we get into some uh, other questions. Um, is that when it comes to the creation event, as you stated, God created a functionally mature universe. So would that then indicate that since, let's say, God instantly created uh, trees and rocks, if we were the, uh, to then analyze as scientists the initial leaves on the trees and, and say rocks, should we be surprised then to find both chlorophyll and atoms in the rocks? Like, let's say that we were to detect lead. In the initial rocks it would be wrong then for us to assume that lead came through natural processes for example uranium to lead uh, would right. that be accurate to say correct yes and so uh, because we're thinking of things developmentally uh, even if it's if it didn't actually occur in uh in six days uh, and god created ex nihilo uh, that development somehow must have existed in the mind of god and so uh and Anything that happens in the mind of God, that's real. It's real to him, right? It's not like us. We think of things in our mind. Uh, it's not real. But since God is God, if he thinks of something, it's real. Uh, even if uh, he hasn't placed that thing into our historical context. And I like the point you made, Ken, where you pointed out the fact that we don't know what an infant universe would look like. This is the only universe we have. This is the only earth we have. When it comes to human beings, I mean, we've seen the process of, uh, you know, zygote to birth to eventually 30, 60 years. We've seen this. We have a proxy. We have experience. But we right. don't have that with, with another universe. This is the only universe we're dealing with. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's important because, and I realize there are other uh, viewpoints out there, uh, right? There is uh, the white hole uh, uh, theory. Um, there is... Um, uh the D dasha theory uh by danny faulkner uh process related creation there are different opinions uh, cosmological positions on the creation of the universe um those ones uh will incorporate a lot of, they'll they'll incorporate both uh both uh science science like scientific uh, laws and miracles kind of sort of welded together uh in my perspective the only miracle is is the fact that God brought all of that into existence in six days. In other words, the um, the scientific application uh, should be completely uh, it should completely correspond with a secular perspective. And um, one last thing I'll say before we get to some of these important questions that we have here. Um, and of course, I'd like to hear your thoughts, George. What comes to mind for me, Ken, is I like to spend a lot of time studying uh, genetics and biology. And I think about the initial creation of Adam and Eve. If scientists were to come a, an hour after the creation of, let's say, Adam, and, and they were to do a genetic sequence, well, are they going to find DNA differences? And if they do, then from the uh, secular mindset, they're going to conclude past ancestors, right? A history of ancestry. When in fact, no, Adam was specially created by God himself. And that would only make sense because uh, I've often pointed out that when God said to be fruitful and multiply, it wouldn't make sense for that to be carried out through cloning. So to, to front load Adam and Eve with pre-existing genetic differences, DNA differences make sense. But to the right. secularists, they would determine uh, a history. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Absolutely. I think that, that Adam was created with a whole bunch of genetic diversity. 
um, as though uh, there were uh, there was a whole bunch of um, uh, you know allele changes in populations over time. So I think that 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 yes, uh, he would have been created with a with a bunch of genetic diversity, and in fact we see something kind of like that in, with with Jesus Christ, who uh, was uh, virgin born and yet he's a man. Um, which means where do you get his Y chromosome from? Um, right. No, uh, and his Y chromosome and uh, uh, half of his DNA uh, wasn't just a blank slate. It had some kind of genetic diversity, alleles, uh, behavioral uh, pieces that were supernaturally uh, created. Uh, and so uh, when you look at things that uh, sort of supernatural uh, creations like this, uh, I'm not saying Jesus is supernaturally created. I mean, uh, his how his DNA was formed. Right. Um, it's not that God's lying to us. God clearly told us that uh, Jesus was virgin born, even though he has a Y chromosome. And we know from science that Y chromosomes only come when two adults come together uh, and make a baby. Right. Right. Great point. Great point, uh, Ken. Well, I don't want to steal all the time, George. I know you probably had some comments to make. What were your thoughts on the presentation? And then we'll get right into some of these questions. So, uh, George, go ahead, brother. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I love the presentation. I, I've got a couple of things to add. You know, in Job um, chapter 37, verse 14, um, it's, it states, Listen to this, O Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Now, now at a uh, wreath lecture, Prince Charles was quoted as saying, why should modern science rule out special creation? And I agree with him. Now, we're often accused by evolutionists that we use arguments from ignorance. I mean... I counter that and say, no, we actually use arguments from knowledge. And I'll use the example of computer science. Now, computer science advanced because of the study into our DNA, our DNA code, and then found out that there's prescriptive information and multiple algorithms. Now, I've done uh, a course in, co in computer science. Algorithms are nothing more than decision matrices. Decision matrices are products of intelligence. That's an argument from knowledge, not from ignorance. When, when, um, with the when the evolution, evolution it talks about the creation of the universe, they say nothing created everything from nothing. To me, that is supernatural. Yeah, that's what yeah, I, I like to add. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think that uh, when we, you know, there, there are, there are uh, struggles as creationists. You know, we observe nature today. And we don't observe uh, continents moving at rapid rates, right? We don't observe mountains growing rapidly. We have to believe by faith that that actually occurred. And, and we've got a great uh, scriptural example, uh, the global flood of Noah, um, that clearly would be, uh, cl would clearly demonstrate a non uniformitarian way of looking at the world. And what we're looking at now is really just sort of the after effects of that. But you have to have faith as a Christian. Uh, to believe in a non-uniformitarian perspective where uh, where plates and uh, move very, very rapidly or mountains grew very, very rapidly. It's much easier, I think, as, a, as an evolutionist to believe that. However, on the other side, as you said, George, there are other things that don't accord with what we see today. For example, uh, we, we don't see the emergence of life from non-life. If you, you look at the world today and according to everything we know about science and everything we experience, that just should not happen. Uh, universes don't pop into existence according to what we know today by experience. And so it's interesting that, um, and, I, and this is in, in my book uh, as well, uh, just a quick plug, my book as well, we talk about that in, uh, I think it's chapter nine, uh, where God's kind of built in um, this uh, ambiguity into nature where there seems to be uh, evidence supporting a view, your view, whichever view you have, but then there's sort of evidence that doesn't support your view, which leads people uh, back to faith. Uh, there is room for unbelief, if you like, uh, in uh, nature, where God wants people to come back to the scriptures. He wants people to come back to the gospel rather than resting in areas of philosophy and science um, to have a relationship with Christ. Well, those are some great points, uh, 
Ken. And um, that being said, I'm going to kind of go into a question here that uh, relates to a lot of what we've been talking about. And it's a common question put forth by both evolutionists and creationists. Um, what should creationists, especially young earth creationists, think of radiometric dating? Yeah, good. That's a really good point. And of course, that is the, I think, the most difficult point uh, as a creationist. And so I want to be, um, I want to be uh, transparent with that. Um, I think that that is the most difficult area for creationists. Uh, I did a radioisotope class when I was doing my graduate degree. And uh, there's just a lot of strong evidence supporting uh, the fact that millions of years worth of decay have occurred. I think that's something that we need to accept as creationists. And that's not just not me saying that. If you look at the rate book uh, with Andrew Snelling and John Baumgartner, all of those guys clearly say that in their book, that there's been some kind of accelerated decay in the past, whether that was just during creation week, which would perfectly fit in with a process related creation that I'm talking about, or whether that was during the flood. So um, that's a reality. Um, however, uh, creationists have shown clearly that there are problems with radiometric data. Uh, the, the, there are uh, many assumptions built into it, and we've clearly shown uh, that there are many, many different dates uh, that come up in radioisotope dates. It's, that's a reality. However, again, it does, does seem to be true that the uh, rocks at the top of the geologic column do seem to date younger than the rocks at the bottom of the geologic column. So again, a creationist needs to be able to respond to that. Um, so I don't want to say, carte blanche, that radioisotope dates are bogus. Um, and I hear a lot of that in creationists, and we've just got to stop doing that. Um, that really shows uh, an ignorance for the reality of the science. Um, millions of years worth of decay does seem to be suggested in the rocks, at least from what I have seen. Um, and it does seem to be a relative difference as you go up and down the column. And I think the best way to address that then is uh, through radioisotope uh, acceleration. Uh, either at creation week, which makes sense, at the fall, which is possible as well. And as creationists and Christians, we've got to be willing to let God do what God wants to do. However, there may have been uh, a radioisotope decay pulse during the flood as well. Why? Well, the best way to get plates moving is to heat them up. And the best way to heat them up is to get that uranium burning. So it's a possibility. However, I want to caution people when it comes to, to the flood, I think as creationists, that needs to be a, a default, uh, not a default. It needs to be a, a backup, if you like. Uh, we need to be looking for naturalistic explanations for uh, radioisotope acceleration during the flood. However, that doesn't deny the possibility that God actually did accelerate rates for the purpose of generating a global flood and moving plates. And I like the way you put that, too, in, in that if... If there was some type of accelerated decay during the flood, well, that heat and energy would would assist. It would be a, a nice feature in getting the plates to move in the first place. If you're looking to these right. meters per second movements right. of the plate, I, I I'd be curious then as to your thoughts, uh, Ken. If we were to look to accelerated decay proces processes at creation versus say the flood, would that change anything about the the uh, extra heat being generated during these these processes would then a, a, the special creation event would, would god have then uh resorted to su super cooling or uh what i guess what are your thoughts on that right well my view of creation week uh, whether uh, i mean I, I have a i have a view that essentially uh looks at uh naturalistic processes all occurring rapidly at the same rates uh, which means it would be kind of like looking at a time lapse. So if you were to go back uh, and look at the record, uh, you would not be able to differentiate uh, the length of time it took, but you would be able to differentiate a sequence of events that would fit within an, uh, a naturalistic paradigm, if that makes sense. Okay, right. We would have to believe by faith because we know from Scripture how long it took. So if that's the case, then during creation week, uh, the rapid or accelerated radioisotope decay is actually not rapid or accelerated because the rate of heat dissipation is is 
relative to the rate of radioisotope decay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So although, although both are accelerated during creation week, along with every other uh, naturalistic uh, uh, process, the only one that's not is actually the revolution of the Earth around the sun, because that's the that's the relative frame of reference God uses for time. Everyone knows that when the sun goes up, that's the day. And when the sun goes down, we're back to, to night and you've got another day following. And it's the best, most simplest reference for a day. And so God uses the rotation of the earth and day one, day two, day three to show clearly morning, uh, day, evening, morning, what a day is. He wants us to know a frame of reference. He makes it clear. But all other processes, I think, are sped up relative to each other, which means the patient rate would equal the radioisotope rate, decay rate. Amen. Well said. Well said. It makes me automatically think about those nature programs that I really like to watch where you have, as you pointed out, this time lapse where you can see a year or two worth of uh, growth from seed to tree or, you know, these these beautiful flowers just coming up. You know, that's the way I, I see the special creation event where you right. see this uh, rapid forming and, and creation of plants, animals, the earth. Um, so well said, Ken, then um, I'd like to ask this question next, uh, I guess, pertaining to what we're talking about is if a skeptic were to then ask Dr. Colson, you know, what are then some of the better or best arguments supporting young earth creation in terms of evidence? Right. And again, this comes back to that ambiguity. You know, I think I think that the, a, a very wrong perspective for creationists is to is to say that oh all the evidence just points to a young Earth that's just that's just the way it is that's not true, and we need to be honest and humble with the data, and I think God's purposely done that to bring us back to Scripture. Remember, as creationists, we're creationists second, we're Christians first, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is primary. And I think God wants us to focus on the gospel. Um, but there is scientific evidence that suggests that the earth is young. And, you know, I think that soft tissue uh, in dinosaur uh, remains is clearly uh, this is this is one that uh, uh, scientists right now are fighting hard to somehow prove uh, using a naturalistic time frames. And so they'll come up with all sorts of different ideas. Uh, but when you go and look at the literature, you can see inconsistencies. In, in those ideas. And so I've got a couple of uh, video series on my YouTube channel on that. I've also got a, a, a blog article, uh, is written out in a blog article on my uh, on my website, www.creationunfolding.com. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's one. Uh, but there are others as well. I think that C14 in uh, bones and other organic remains is another good one. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, a personal favorite of mine is actually rapid uh, rapid evolution. Uh, now I, I, I use that I use that with a little e. Okay, I'm talking about change over time, and I realize that the word evolution uh, can have lots and lots of different meanings. I do not mean by that word uh, uh, molecules to man evolution. I do not mean that uh, humans came from apes, but I do believe there has been some substantial change in organisms over time. And an example would be uh, there's a paper came out in uh, 2021, which I've got it here people wanted to go read it. Uh, I've got the title here. Uh, uh, it's called Rapid Hybrid Speciation in Darwin's Finches. Yes. Um, and in that paper, uh, the author talks about um, uh, the evolution of a, of a new species of finch, which they actually observed in 40 years. And what's interesting is there's only a total now of 16 species of finches, but the uh, the secular dating for how long it took for those 15 species to develop is 3 million years. Well, if you divide the 15 species that we already have into that, that's 130,000 years per species. So how is it that you get 130 years, 130,000 years to change one, change these all the other 15 species, but only 40 years to change the into the 16th species? That doesn't make any sense. No. So um, there's got to be something wrong then with the uh, standard rate at which we measure, uh, which we measure a time. Um, and, and there are others as well. Um, I think of a stasis in the rock record is a really good one. Uh, you know, considering that the rate of change, biological change of organisms is actually quite fast. Uh, and scientists now are uh, providing more and more 
uh, data on rapid changes. And they're like, wow, how is this so possible? I mean, we look at the geologic record and it seems as though evolution takes a long, long time, but we're actually seeing it happen very rapidly. Um, well, how is it that you get uh, uh, animals like coelacanth uh, or the horseshoe crab that are almost identical, they're not identical, uh, but almost identical, and yet they've been around for supposedly 400 million years, creeping around the oceans without changing. Um, I just, that is very difficult for me to, uh, to to appreciate. 400 million years, and yet we've got the these creatures that are very complex. A silicon is a very complex animal, and yet it has changed only just a little bit in that time. Well, that's a fantastic so, so there is evidence out there, um, but again, for the skeptic, uh, you see, for the skeptic, the skeptic is always going to find evidence that supports his or her conclusions. And I believe, again, I believe that that is God's design. I believe that there is room for unbelief. Uh, now, by the way, I say that, and I'm a, I'm a reformed, I would say I'm a reformed Baptist. Uh, so I believe in predestination. Uh, I believe uh, in, uh, you know, the, all those things. But uh, from a human perspective, uh, there is room for unbelief. And uh, as humans who are responsible, we need to look at the evidence in Scripture primarily. That needs to be where we go uh, for truth. And we need to pray to the Lord and ask the Lord for answers. So if someone's coming and throwing scientific evidence at us, and there's going to be evidence that, con that contradicts our perspective, We've got to point people back to the gospel. Amen. Well said. So many good points there, Ken. I could probably, uh, you know, comment on them all day. One thing I'll say is that that paper about, uh, you know, rapid speciation in these bird finches, I find fascinating as well, because we've oftentimes heard for years and years that the skeptics will say there's far too many species today to explain in just 4,500 years since the flood. But the last time I checked, um, bird species wise, there's only about 16 to 18,000 today. And yet we're seeing new species of, of finches, for example, form, uh, before our very own eyes in real time. So it, it makes me, it, it, it's very curious to think about their model where they would, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, they would put the origin of, of birds somewhere a couple hundred million years ago from theropod like dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. So my question would be, I guess, to the evolutionists, why aren't there more bird species then if you have a few hundred million years of, of speciation events? I know that they would look to extinction events and, and such. But my point would be, it seems like the number of species today, as you kind of pointed out, is um, nicely in line with the young earth creation model. Um, I, right. I guess what it would well, yeah, I agree. And but there are there's still there are still some issues with that. So uh, from a creationist perspective, uh, we've got to believe in some fairly um, substantial change in uh, in organisms since the flood. And if you go to the ARC exhibit, uh, Answers in Genesis ARC exhibit, it's excellent. You should go and have a look at it. Uh, you know, for example, they've got the three-toed uh, Mesohippus in there. Um, that's a substantially different organism than the modern horse. Right. And um, that's a lot of change. In really, in realistically speaking, it wasn't over 4,500 years. It had to have been over less than a thousand years because uh, we have descriptions of horses uh, from about a thousand years after the flood. So that kind of change had to happen very rapidly. And natural selection uh, is not a good way of explaining that. Uh, so creationists need to be thinking about other ways in which we can get that kind of change. Uh, no, not mutation over, over millions of years. But maybe some kind of um, uh, some kind of directed uh, design, mediated design uh, was a, a good uh, a good phrase that Todd Wood put out there. Mediated design, uh, where it's been built into the genetics somehow. And I think this is where creation and, uh, has got a lot of research it can do and can contribute scientifically speaking. Because even the uh, evolutionary model. Um, is not able to really answer how you get macro evolution. They know that natural selection uh, is uh, Darwinianism, even neo-Darwinism with the whole synthesis. They understand that even with all those bits and pieces, it just doesn't quite, it doesn't quite answer the question of how you get macro evolution. Um, and so even they're sort of not sure. There's, I, I, I believe there are other mechanisms out there that have yet to be uh, discovered. Um, and 
given a brand new world after the flood, um, what a perfect environment uh, for that kind of rapid uh, speciation and, and uh, a change to occur. Amen. And, and you mentioned Dr. Todd Wood, and I like what he said. He said ever-changing environments would then require ever-changing genomes. And the right. problem that I've, I've found with the evolutionists is they want to assume that all genetic diversity, for the most part, is the result of mutations over time. Right. While we were pointing out earlier that uh, there is evidence, I, I think especially in, in epigenetics, that God uh, may have front-loaded uh, right. diversity into the original original Absolutely. kinds. And, and I know we could probably talk about that all day, but since we only got a little bit more time with you, Ken, and your answers are so great and informative, I do want to um, at least get this question out. And I do want to point to, uh, out to the audience, please check. we got a great chat. People are loving this. Please check the description box for more uh, information pertaining to the, these answers. Because I know you've, you've done an article as well, Ken, on uh, horse evolution, which you kind of brought up there. So I want people to check that out. Um, so I guess the question would be, Ken, are the Earth's massive coal beds a problem for young Earth creation? Uh, no, I think they're one of the strongest evidences in view, view of catastrophism. Uh, when, you, when you look at uh, the, you know, you got, 20,000 feet thick, some of these uh, cyclothems of, 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 of beds of coal and shale and limestone and sandstone. And um, uh, the, the, the secular belief is that uh, these coal beds formed uh, because there was a swamp, which you have to have very, very specific and uh, a very, very specific environment uh, for the formation of a swamp. Then there was a transgression. Uh, and uh, then there was a regression and another swamp grew exactly on that spot with those very precise parameters that are needed for a swamp. And yet that supposedly happened, you know, maybe 30 or 40 times uh, in, on exactly the same spot. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, a better explanation would be that these uh, coal beds were allochthonous, uh, which means they were transported uh, and that they were deposited in some kind of a marine environment. And this is actually a perspective that... Um, uh, secular scientists had in the late uh, 1800s and uh, very, very early 1900s, this was actually a perspective that was out there. It was called the Allochthonous model for coal formation. Uh, but of course, at the end of the day, uniform materialism won out. And, um, and so we have the, the secular view that we have today. But again, there's an article, I have a long article on that, uh, which, which I think shows that the creationist model uh, is, is better. Uh, standing. Oh yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. Go ahead, uh, George. I, I I know I've kind of been dominating. Um, uh, the well, that's okay. No, that's okay. You had any, any... <laughs> can I can I, I've, heard, I've heard many even secular and uh, old Earth geologists um, are sort of putting uniformitarianism or throwing it under the bus, if I can say that, because they're now more accepting of uh, catastrophic processes, but in their mind, it's cyclical. Um, I've, I heard, um, I won't mention his name, that, that, it, that one of the first, very first things he said on a, um, on an atheist channel, and he's an old earth creationist, was that, um, uh, Lyle, no one really accepts Lyle's, uh, uniformitarian principles anymore. And, and, and uh, I'll cite, uh, say one example would be, um, Say Mount Everest, for example, we know it's around what 8.8 .8 kilometers high. Is it 8.4 or some, somewhere around there? And it mm -hmm. took about 70 million years to form. And you read the literature, and it, and they say that it's actually rising by five to ten millimeters per year. If you do the simple maths, you should you should get something around about. Um, 70 kilometers high for Mount Everest. But even if you account for the erosion rates, their own erosion rates, you still don't get anywhere near 8.8 .8 kilometers high. Uh, I mean, there are so many other evidences that point uh, towards a young earth and uh, disprove old earth that it's not funny, yet uh, they come up with, I call them rescue devices as to how they explain them. The erosion rates is another perfect example I mean, by their own reckoning, the Earth's landscape should have eroded down to sea level within a mere uh, ten, was it 12 to 15 million years. Mm -hmm. That in itself speaks volumes of um, what they're trying to defend. 
Yeah, I mean, you look at that in the uh, in the fossil in the fossil record uh, with the sedimentary record, where uh, rates of sedimentation today are incredibly fast compared to uh, what the rates of sedimentation in the geologic record. Uh, so, if you take a section of uh, Paleozoic, uh, some formation of the Paleozoic, um, and you the way they, of course find that uh, sedimentation rate is they take uh, absolute dating through radioisotope methods from uh, the lower part and the upper part and they divide uh, that by how many years and that's how they get their sedimentation rates. But when you do that, you find out that uh, the sedimentation rates today, uh, I forget how many times it is, it might be 10 times faster today than it was in the past. Um, there are many other things as well that uh, don't fit with, uh, you know, the, 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 the present is the key to the past. Uh, things like when you look at Paleozoic and Mesozoic formations, they're very flat and tabular. Uh, when you look at Cenozoic uh, formations, and they're typically what's called basin and range formations or, or basin formations where a mountain range has gone up and it created a basin and sort of all the materials fallen into a basin. So they're very, very deep, but they're not very uh, spatial. They don't have a, a large aerial distribution. Well, that is not the way we see uh, what we look at in the past. When we look at the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic, Sedimentation was very, very different. Something was different back then. Um, and I think that's where we can come in as catastrophists and uh, ex you know, better explain some of, that, uh, some of that data. Now, importantly, if you've read my paper on uh, my pre-flood boundary, uh, I am suggesting that a lot of the geologic record was not deposited by the flood. Uh, I'm suggesting that a lot of it was deposited uh, both before the flood and after the flood. The flood was kind of like the pinnacle, the zenith, if you like, uh, of uh, worldwide catastrophism. Um, but that would mean then that there could have been periods of time, both before and certainly after the flood, I know creationists believe this, uh, where there were events uh, of deposition occurring over centuries. Um, and we can still call that catastrophic uh, because uh, in a secular perspective, any one formation typically is deposited over millions and millions of years. But when you start to say it could have been deposited in decades uh, or centuries, that is catastrophic. And uh, so I like using uh, catastrophic terminology uh, rather than uh, uh, flood geology, if you like. So we, we, we've heard of flood geology and in my paper, again, I, I don't quite like the term flood geology because it sort of implies that all of the geological record was deposited during the flood. Yeah, one of the, one of the things I like about uh, some of the things you've said, uh, you're a proponent of critical thinking and... Uh, as, a, as an engineer, we were taught that uh, early on in our um, course. Uh, one of the things they don't do today at schools is actually teach critical thinking, from what I've seen anyway. And if they did, uh, a lot of people would sit back and ask some of these hard questions, but they, they tend to accept them for uh, what um, the authority says. That If the authority says they're true, they must be true, without really asking the question themselves. Oh, hold on, let's have a look at this and and think about it and assess what they're saying and find out whether that is true. Right. I find that so many examples of that. The, uh, unfortunately, that's true of both the secular and it's true in the Christian realm as well. As a teacher, I was a teacher at a at a, um, a, a for Christian universities uh, online and I taught in the classroom. Uh, and a lot of the students, uh, you know, they grew up in Christian homes and uh, they get fed uh, sort of a, a, a very basic creationist model, uh, come up with things that a lot of that a lot of creationists don't even believe anymore. Um, and so uh, I think that as creationists, we, uh, especially if we're teaching our children, we need to be informed and we need to be thinking critically uh, about uh, other arguments from a, from a naturalistic perspective. Well, that's, yeah, well, uh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Andrew. I was going to say, yeah, we're, we're some, sometimes we're accused in this channel of uh, bringing in guests with differing of a difference of opinion, but uh, we've often said that we're proponents of critical thinking, so we leave it up to the viewer to decide for themselves what they actually believe. So we can't, based on what you said, Ken, we, we can't narrow our, our view, we can't put blinkers on and just say one thing, Right. Let, expose them to all everything that's out there and let them make a decision based on on that information right good yeah. amen amen well said um as we start wrapping it up ken because i i want to be um 
I want to thank you again for the, the, the time you've given to us. I, I wanted to ask you, because I find your uh, dissertation on Cambrian uh, stromatolites and microbialites. Good job. Uh, you know, <laughs> there we go. I finally got it. Um, you know, quite interesting and, and fascinating. I was wondering if we could kind of wind down with, with a question pertaining to your dissertation, if you can kind of explain a little bit about it, and uh, especially for the audience sake, too, if they're interested. Okay, so you're talking about my dissertation or my AIJ paper on it? Um, I, I guess both. I, I've more so read your AI. Sure. Or, um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I did my research uh, on uh, microbialites or stromatolites, which are kind of like, um, well, gee whiz, they're just, uh, think of microbes that uh, get lots of dirt stuck in their kind of sticky uh, sheaths. Okay. And uh, because they're a cyanobacteria, they have to climb up to another level and then they get dirt in there again and they have to climb up to another level and they keep doing that. They build a mound and we call that a microbialite or a chromatolite. And usually, but not always, it has layers in it. And so that's what my research was on. And uh, my, I did my research in Utah, uh, in southeastern Utah, and uh, there are there's a huge uh, fossil assemblage of uh, stromatolites out there. I mean, literally thousands of square kilometers uh and um you know like uh kilometers thick i mean not 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 all the way through but uh the the uh, formation that i looked at the, about 300 meters or about uh no 300 feet uh worth of stromatolite beds about 11 beds uh so you have a bed of stromatolites that might be about sort of uh, 10 feet thick and then you have like a whole bunch of uh limestone and then you have another bed of stromatolites and these are stacked one on top of the other and so my research was looking at those now these are upper cambrian um and um there's a huge a real a stink a, a, a real so a, a geographical distribution not just in that area but in uh nevada and california um, that whole area there are thousands of square kilometers of these upper cambrian stromatolites so the question is, well, uh, since uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, I guess, a, uh, most creationists would believe that the flood uh, uh, was a, a Cambrian event that started in the early Cambrian, well, how do we get these thick beds of stromatolites in the upper Cambrian? And that's really what my ARJ paper is on. And so in that paper, I argue that uh, the Cambrian should belong in the pre-flood world. So we're actually looking at a pre-flood biome rather than flood generated sediments very interesting very interesting yeah I, I definitely recommend the audience uh check out again the description box especially anybody new to the show right now um you know we've been going for over an hour here so please check the description box for more on ken so much great information uh i think i could speak for george as well we could talk to you all day about this uh important information and topic and again great presentation and uh, we're going on the hour and 10 minute mark. So we definitely look forward to hopefully having you on again in the future, maybe focusing sure. on yeah. a dinosaur soft tissue. Um, yeah, was there some final words, concluding thoughts uh, from you? Uh, just, I mean, I don't know, I guess, I guess, um, you know, as creationists, I, I, I would like us all to be um, humble uh, in our attitude, I, I just get on a lot of uh, social media websites and see creationists being very uh, nasty uh, to uh, evolutionists, and um, and I just I just think that we often sometimes treat creationism like a religion, and uh, it's great to study creation. It's great to study God's creation, um, but ultimately uh, our primary goal is to glorify Jesus Christ. And um, we need to be mindful of that. And, uh, you know, Paul says in Titus, I, I can't, I don't remember exactly what he says, but uh, he says that we need to speak kindly, something like we need to speak kindly and reasonably to all people uh, with humility. And he's talking about unbelievers. And so just that we would be uh, humble, we would recognize there are issues in creationism. Uh, and when we are on our, uh, you know, uh, social media sites, we would not be attacking uh, other people. That is not going to win people to Christ. We would be uh, seeking to win people to Christ and not arguments. That's kind of something that I, I really feel is important in creationism, uh, that we uh, put Christ 
uh, up as primary in in our in our philo philosophical perspective. Amen. Well said. That was uh, well said. I, I like the way you put it, and it, it makes me think about it's it's not about winning arguments; it's about winning souls. It's about bringing people right. to to Christ. And That's I know oftentimes. Doing. Yeah, and oftentimes the discussion can get heated with with an evolutionist, and I know I'm I'm personally guilty of that as well. And that's why I think what you've you've said there is is so important and and such an important important point to take home. Uh, so, amen. Well said, uh, Ken and George. We didn't forget about you, brother. Any any final words, final thoughts from you as well? Yeah, I, I agree with I agree with Ken's uh, sentiments on that last uh, bit, but uh, there there are some atheists who really join these kind of sessions purely to mock and ridicule and uh, sometimes um, you know we're all human and and we get emotional and uh like you donny i've i've i can be accused of uh saying a few things that i regret saying so yeah i agree with you ken yeah no good and i understand what you're saying about the the hardcore atheists there are they are out there they enjoy doing what they do they get on those social media oh, yeah. sites because most of the time they can pretty much undercut uh, the average Christian creationist who gets on there. They just can because they typically get on their PhDs. Uh, they're very well uh, articulated. And unless the creationist really knows his stuff, uh, they the Christian really should pull back and uh, put forth Christ, put forth the gospel, put forth scripture, uh, because it's the word of God that convinces, not scientific evidence. Scientific evidence, if that convinced people, then God would have made that clear in Scripture. But God clearly says in Scripture, uh, I think of 1 Corinthians one twenty one. he says, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. In other words, through its own wisdom. In other, and then it goes on to say, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. That's what's going to convince people. It's the foolishness of the cross, not scientific evidence. And the Scriptures actually tell us that. It actually says that right there in 1 Corinthians one twenty one that in the wisdom of God, the world did not come to know God through wisdom. And you can insert science or philosophy or anything in there. Amen. Amen. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's right. So, you know, that's what's going to save. That's what's going to open people's hearts and and minds is is yeah. the gospel it's the power of gospel that of the gospel that saves so well yeah. said i i love it uh, dr colson again i i want to thank you so much for giving us your time for this very important show we've had a great audience and uh, a lot of great feedback as well so that being said um thanks again ken and uh hopefully we can have you on again in, in the future god bless it was good thank you